The Lord be with you. It's times like these that I wish I had the gifts of uh, Luke Powery. Luke is the uh, dean of the chapel at Duke and uh, has an undergraduate in vocal performance and can probably sing better than he can preach. And so it's always at these times that I'm like, well, I don't have that gift, so thank you, Linnell. And uh, as I say many times, we've got this order of service wrong. We need to put the sermon further up. This morning we'll be reading from the 21st chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 1, reading through verse 11 this morning on this Palm Sunday. Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse 1. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the valley ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her, Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this. The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? Eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, may you give us ears now to hear your words. While whatever words, Lord, I manage to put in the way are quickly removed and forgotten. Help us, God, to hear your words, words that call us ever on in the kingdom, words that shape us more and more into the likeness of your Son, Jesus our Lord, our Savior, and friend, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, I wonder if you're like me. Do, do you ever get your hopes up? Y'all know what that means, get your hopes up? I used to hear that a lot growing up. My mama would say, we're going to go do this. Don't get your hopes up. We might go do this. Don't get your... To me, that always meant no when she said, don't get your hopes up. So, uh, But I wonder if you're like me, if... if something happens and immediately your mind and your imagination take over and you start to get your hopes up. Like somebody, maybe somebody you work with or somebody you know says, man, I, this past week we were out at lunch with some folks from work and I had the best tacos I've ever had in my whole life. Man, they were amazing. Uh, you got to eat. Now, I don't know if you're like me. I think about tacos a lot. Um, <laughs> and so he says, hey, man, these are the best things. And so you get kind of excited. You're like, well, man, let's go get them. Let's go eat these tacos. Well, let's go Saturday. So you get ready. You put on your best taco-eating pants. Y'all have taco-eating pants, right? You put on your best, you, know, you get ready to go eat tacos. And then you go. You don't eat the bowl of cereal in the morning. You come to the place. There it is. It's what you kind of hope for, right? Looks like a good joint. Looks like a good place. Not too clean, not too dirty, because, you know, tacos, you got to have one right in the middle. The place is full of folks. A lot of people there. That's a good sign. You sit down at the table with your friend. The waiter comes over. What do you have? I don't know. What, what do you? Oh, they say something like, get the, the Trace Grandes tacos. One, two, three. Pork, chicken, and beef. Oh, that sounds good. I'll have those. I mean, grande means big, right? Bring them on. And so the waiter goes back, brings the chips and salsa. No, no, thank you. These tacos, man. My friends talked about these things all week long. The plate comes. They sit it in front of you. And right away, you notice something's off. Yeah, it just doesn't look right. This, doesn't, this isn't what I thought these were. I thought it'd be, you know, handmade tortillas with nice grilled meat. No, it's just something they bought at Walmart, maybe. 
got some old shredded chicken out of a crock pot in the back of the kitchen somewhere. You look at it, well, is this lettuce? Is this cabbage? What is, what is this? But your friend says, no, man, trust me. They look gross, but they're good. <laughs> and so you pick up and you take a bite and you swear it's not chicken, but maybe the chef lost his shoes somewhere. <laughs> all that buildup, all that anticipation, nothing. You don't even finish. You say, can we swing through McDonald's or Jack's on the way back home? Nothing. If I'm honest with you, I get kind of the same feeling about Palm Sunday. Especially the, the, the text, the reading from the Bible around Palm Sunday. Because always in the higher chapters of the Gospels, so a lot's happened. I mean, Jesus has had, in Matthew's Gospel, he's had his Sermon on the Mount. He has healed the blind, he's healed the sick, he's, uh, the lame have walked again. Last week we heard even from John, how he had raised a man who had been dead and in the ground four days. He's fed thousands of people with just a little bit of bread and fish, done all this stuff, and now we know, we know, next week is Easter. That's the, maybe, in case you were wondering, this is Palm Sunday, next week is Easter. Sometimes I used to get it confused, and some folks might show up early thinking it's Easter. But this is, this is sort of the buildup. We're on the precipice of Easter. All this stuff is supposed to be uh, wonderful and exciting. And there's even anticipation in the text, especially Matthew. Matthew says right away, it's there, Jesus had come to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives. Now, what do you know about the Mount of Olives? You ask most folks, what do you know about the Mount of Olives? It's usually, uh, it's in the Bible. Uh, I think it's a mountain. And maybe there's some olives on it. But in Jesus' day, uh, beginning with the Second Temple Judaism, the Mount of Olives became a very important place. If you go to the Holy Land today, you'll find out the Mount of Olives is a mount of cemetery. Biggest cemetery in Jerusalem. Because many of the Jews starting in the Second Temple believed that the Mount of Olives, this is where the culmination of history would take place. This is where Messiah would come. This is when the dead raised out of the graves, they'd start at the Mount of Olives. And so Matthew, writing about Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, says, where did he start? Was it on the west side of town, north side of town? Did he just show up? No. He's coming from the Mount of Olives. And all kinds of lights start going off for the people who read it. All kinds of flags start flying. Oh, he's coming from the Mount of Olives. That's where Messiah comes from. And the anticipation ticks up a little bit. Now, when he's there, Jesus sends two disciples into town. He says, when you go into town and you'll find a donkey and a colt, the foal of a donkey tied there, bring them. If anybody stops, just say, the Lord has need of it and he'll bring it back when he's done. I want to try that at one of these luxury car dealerships in Birmingham. <laughs> just stroll in, say, I need to take it for a test drive. Oh, who are you? Don't worry, the Lord has need of it. He'll bring it back when it's done. But that's what happens. Now, some people say this is Jesus' sort of divine sort of control of things. I think it's just Jesus' divine planning. Called ahead of time. Hey, Joe, going to come into town. Need to borrow the donkey. Going to send two of my boys down there. Okay, Jesus, no problem. But there it is, that donkey. See, now, now Matthew says it's a donkey and the colt, the foal of a donkey. But all the Gospels who mention this story all have a donkey. The thing about riding a donkey on into town, particularly through a gate like that one coming from Mount, the Mount of Olives. This is a sign of a king who's done his business. He's conquered. He doesn't come in on the war horse, sword drawn. No, all that's taken care of. No, he comes in on the donkey, peaceful. There as the great liberator, perhaps, the one who comes into town to say, everything's all right, the war is over, we're at peace, and I guess what? I won. It would be sort of like in our day, he doesn't come in in the big tank, but rather strolls in in the, in the golf cart to just sort of look around. That's the idea. He comes in on a donkey. Oh boy, that anticipation rises a little bit more. That's what the Messiah is going to do. That's what the king is going to do. The Mount of Olives, a donkey, oh boy, this is it. But now Matthew, like I told you, says it's not just a donkey but the colt, the foal of a donkey. In fact, he says this is to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet in verse 5, a mashup of Isaiah and Zechariah. 
Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Do you ever stop to read that and wonder? We talked about this a little bit in Sunday school, our, our class did. What does it look like? How does Jesus ride a colt and a donkey? I mean, does he ride them like a pair of skis? A foot on each one coming into town? Is he lounging between the two? What is he doing? Is he riding on one and then getting off saying, all right, boys, that's halfway. I'm going to ride the colt the rest of the way if you don't mind. What is it? Well, the truth is none. What's important for Matthew is not that Jesus rode in on two animals. What's important for Matthew is that Jesus fulfills Scripture. And for Matthew, that Scripture is this mashup of Isaiah and Zechariah. It could have said that Jesus had to grow purple hair from his nose. And Matthew would have said, and thus the Lord grew with purple hair from his nose. Wouldn't have mattered. The point for Matthew is not historicity, but the fulfillment of prophecy. And so there again, people listening to Matthew. Wait, so he's riding on a donkey and, and he's fulfilling scripture? Here's all of this tension, all this buildup that's coming. He's the Messiah. We've seen all this stuff he's done. Here he comes. And so after he does this, the disciples put the cloaks on the two, do- two the animals. Jesus rides into Jerusalem, whether on one or two, whatever the imaginations may lead us to believe. And this very large crowd, Matthew says, begins to spread their cloaks and the palm branches on the way. Now that's odd. Would you do that? Would you take off your coat if you knew, hey, there's somebody coming and they're riding on a donkey. Let's put our nice clothes in the way. You know, I used to ride horses and mess around with those types of animals. They're good at a few things. They're good at walking, and they're good at leaving stuff behind them when they walk. And so Jesus says, uh, Matthew says, they laid their, their cloaks and palm branches in the road. Why do that? Why would you do that? Because that's what you do when the one who's conquered, the one who's won, comes into town. Here he comes. Our Redeemer, our Savior, the one who has lifted us from the oppression of the ones who once ruled over us. You throw your cloaks down. You throw the palm branches down. More anticipation. More excitement. Here he comes. Here he comes. And then what do they shout? Hosanna to the Son of David. Hosanna is from the the Hebrew word uh, that means to save. Save us to the son of David. Save us to the son of David. This is what they're saying. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Save us. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Oh, you can't can't watch the scene without that little bit of anxiousness. Where's this going? Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior. He's He's riding into town from the Mount of Olives on the back of a donkey, fulfilling Scripture. People are laying things in the road like He's the coming King. They're shouting Hosanna. Words, words reserved for the Messianic figure that is the Son of David. Here He comes. And when He enters Jerusalem, Matthew says that the crowd, the whole city was in turmoil. But that's that's not a good way to say it. The word there is uh, the Greek word seo. It's used two other times in Matthew. Once is when, Matthew, when, when Jesus is on the cross and the gospel says he breathed his last and the earth seo. The earth quaked, shook. And Matthew goes a step farther than the rest of the gospels and said when the earth shook, the tombs opened. And the dead came into town. It quaked. The other place it's used in Matthew is after Christ has been dead, buried in the tomb, sealed with the, with the stone rolled in front of the entrance. An angel comes down to the tomb, and the earth again sail. Shook. An earthquake. Jesus rides into Jerusalem, and it's not that people are just gossiping and talking and saying, oh, you know, the, the people are in turmoil. They're shaking as if it's an earthquake. What's caused all of this? All this anticipation, all this buildup. We've seen all of what Jesus can do, all of who Jesus claims to be, what he is, and now all these signs. He could have ridden in with a neon sign flashing over his head, and people would have wanted it to say, Messiah, Messiah, as he came in. All this happens. 
And when he entered Jerusalem, everything is quaking, everybody's shaking. Why? Because they ask, who is this? Who is this? You think, well, some of them know, but no, that's the thing. Who is it? And the crowds were saying, Matthew tells us, it's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee. Can I tell you something? I don't think that's a good answer. I don't think it's the right answer. The prophet? Oh, yeah, that, that's the prophet. Do you not know what he's done? He's fed thousands of people, raised them from the dead, healed the sick, given sight to the blind. He's walked on water. A prophet? Just a prophet? Oh, that's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Do you know why? You want to know why I think the crowd said that? It's a safe answer. It's a safe one. He's a prophet. Oh, just a prophet. Well, prophets come and go. Prophets come and go. There'll be people who come. They'll gather up a following. It's just a fad. It'll go away. Prophets come and go. Prophets are good teachers. We could use some prophets. Oh, yeah, we need a prophet every once in a while to remind us what the Bible says. Get us back on track. A prophet, that's a safe answer. The crowds are saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee. With that answer, they ignore everything they've seen. Rides down from the Mount of Olives on a donkey. Everybody shouting Hosanna. Everything seems to be pointing to the answer to this question. He's the Messiah. God's anointed. The Son of God. That's who he is. But instead, what do they say? Oh, it's the prophet. It's the prophet from Nazareth and Galilee. I think, no, I, I think I know. That so often when that question is put to us, when it's put to me, who is this? Who is Jesus? Nine times out of ten. Maybe ten out of ten. You know what answer I'm going to give? A safe one. A safe answer. Who is Jesus? Oh, he's, he's uh, my Savior, the one who's going to get me into heaven when I die. Who is Jesus? Oh, he was the baby born at Christmas. You know, in the little diaper, the little person Ricky Bobby talks about in Talladega Nights. Who's Jesus? Who's Jesus? Oh, he was, he was crucified uh, uh, for my sins so that I, I, I'd be forgiven. That's, that's, who's Jesus? I hardly will ever answer. He's the one who tells me that I have to give up everything. I hardly ever say that, you know. Who is Jesus? I, I, I never say, he's the one that by his death showed me that this is the way God works. Not by the power to hold sway over others, but to give it up freely. I never say that. Who is Jesus? Who is this? You know, I never say he's the one who told me that before I, I see the sin in others, before I try uh, to pull the speck from somebody else's eye, I need to get the log out of mine. I never say that. Who is this? I always have a safe answer. Because I know... I know if I say who he really is, that I have to do what he says. That I have to believe what he says. And I've got to change who I am to be who he calls me to be. I mean, if the crowds had said, who is this? Oh, that's Jesus the Messiah, the Son of the living God who's come to take away the sins of the world, to turn the earth upside down, or maybe right side up, to bring the full loving kingdom of God into a reality on earth as it is in heaven. They'd have probably stuck them on a cross. But instead, instead, who is this? Oh, it's the prophet Jesus from Nazareth and Galilee. It's safe. It's not wrong, but it's not the full answer. It's not the whole answer. And so I wonder sometimes, especially in seasons like this, in seasons when our spiritual sensitivity is high, when we think about Easter, when we, we think about uh, the cross, when we think about Jesus paying it all, when we think about the empty tomb. I wonder if, if we don't need to stop more often and ask, who is this? Who is Jesus? And to give the whole answer. 
to give the whole answer, even if it makes us, makes us a little squirmy, even if we don't like the whole answer. There's a lot of stuff Jesus says, calls us to that we don't like, that I don't like, but it's there. If maybe we ought to stop every once in a while and ask ourselves, who is this? Who is Jesus? And truthfully, honestly, give the full answer and then realize that the Jesus we confess, the Jesus we claim to love and follow, is the same Jesus who calls us to do the hard things in the Bible. Who is this? I wonder. If you were standing on the road going into Jerusalem this morning, waving the palms, throwing your cloaks in the road, if the question came to you, if someone nudged you in the side and said, who is this? I wonder what your answer would be. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, giver of the Holy Spirit, one who is, as the Scripture says, our rock, our redeemer, our friend, our savior, and our God. Lord, help us when we, the question is put before us who is Jesus? Help us, Lord, to answer faithfully and to understand that when we answer, it is not about just responding to a question, but responding to your presence in our lives. Help us, God, to answer faithfully and to live faithfully into the answer we give. And if we trust you to be the Lord of our lives, Lord, may you be the Lord of all of our lives, of all of what we have and who we are. So Christ be with us. Be with us now, Holy Spirit, speak to us. Have us, Lord, to respond to your presence in whatever way we need this morning. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.